Okay, I think we'll make a start. Do not worry, this will be recorded, so you'll be able to catch up later if you're coming in a bit, a bit late. My name is Sebastian Chastin. I'm from Glasgow Caledonian University and Ghent University, and I'm the coordinator of Elf Cascade. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you all to this first episode of our co-creation masterclasses. We really want to thank the Scottish Co-Production Week for hosting us, and we are encouraging you to check out all the great events this week. We certainly have enjoyed a lot of them, and we are really uh, happy and uh, and to have contributed our own our own uh, contribution to this. The aim of this session is really to share knowledge and the tools that help put any co-creation onto a good start and ensure it stays trustworthy through the process for all those involved. And we are going to do today is to walk you step by step on getting first of all the basics down and to show you some of the tool that supports this in the process. So as I said, we are recording the session so you can catch up at your own convenience and share it with colleagues. So don't worry if you're entering a little bit late or if you miss a bit, you'll be able to catch up and we'll make this uh, freely available on our website. I have to admit that we had to change the format of this event quite a lot due to an overwhelming demand. Uh, we have had more than 300 people registered for this event, which is the maximum capacity that the digital technology will allow us to have. We initially wanted to do something a lot more intimate and run you to, through what we call a protocol clinic, which is a process that we use to ensure that co-creation is trustworthy by planning it adequately from the start. And we wanted to discuss that using some of your co-creation projects and help you individually or in small groups step by step. However, there's just simply too many of us today to do this. So instead, we've changed this a little bit and we are gonna engage you through a game of collective learning. So while we are waiting for a few more people to join us, grab your mobile phone or open another browser uh, window on your computer because that will allow you to interact with us and take part in this collective game of learning. We have disabled the audio and the video to make sure that everything runs smoothly, but you can interact with us through the chat and you will be interacting with us through the game. Our project, project manager, Neve Smith, and the other member of the Earth Cascade teams are there to help you if there is any problem, so just contact them via the chat. And we are also inviting as much feedback and questions as you have. We might not have the time to answer them all today, but we'll definitely endeavor to answer them all. We'll collect them at the end and we will post our answers on our website and send it out through our, through our newsletter as well, when the questions are even, evidently appropriate. So first, let me introduce Health Cascade. Health Cascade is a large consortium funded by the European Commission as a Marie Curie Innovative Training Network. It's a large multidisciplinary teams based around seven universities across Europe and many PhD students and Marie Curie fellows. And we are actually talking to you from all over Europe today. Uh, <clears throat> and we are working very closely with a large network of organizations in various sectors, ranging from public health to digital technologies to make co-creation a robust, rigorous, systematic, and trustworthy methodology to solve societal problems. And all of us are very passionate about it. There is no doubt that you, if you are here, you're also very passionate about it. And you have joined us because you have heard or you have witnessed the benefit that co-creation can have. But there are also some caveats, like with any other methodologies, and some potential danger and risk. And I think we've heard some of them this week's in various talks about people that have engaged with co-creations and came out not so happy 
or actually have noticed some real uh, some real problems out of it or some negative consequences. So this happens generally when co-creation is not planned properly and not conducted properly. Often when we use it just as a tick box exercise or when we are not doing it the best we can. So the point of today is to try to get that starting point right. <clears throat> so for us as a network, we are engaging in a systematic inquiry about how to make co-creation trustworthy, a rigorous, robust, and systematic methodologies so it can have a positive impact and minimize the negative consequences. We are developing an evidence base for co-creation, some theory, some methods, and how to evaluate its impact. We are also developing enabling technology, digital technologies, that will help facilitate the process of co-creation, but also facilitate its governance. So to make sure it happens in a trustworthy and beneficial way. We are putting all these to the test by tackling a host of different health issues in different sectors, such as health and care, education, urbanism, or the workplace, in involving different populations, so that we can immediately put these methods and theories to the test. This is an ongoing process, and our program of work is ambitious and is really aimed at building capacity. So today, what we are doing is delivering the first installment of this about the lessons we have learned and the tool we have developed to really try to get co-creation to a good start. But enough said about us. Let's get started with our interaction. Please grab your mobile phones or open a new browser window and join us on Menti. You can do that by scanning the QR code on the screen with your mobile phone or using your browser to go to www.menti.com and enter the code 25911216. And there we will ask you some questions through this interactive app that, that will allow us to proceed through the day. So we are gonna start with a few simple questions to make sure everybody's on board and uh, everybody is able to use that technology. So we'll wait a minute or so to make sure everybody is joining us okay. I see loads of people telling us they are now on Menti. That's fabulous. Loads of thumbs up. Um, great, thank you very much for being game. And we can then start with the first question. And our first question is very simply, where are you calling from? And we'll see all the answers appearing on the screen as a um, word cloud. Oh, we have loads of people from Belgium. That's great. Scotland, obviously, since this is a Scottish co-production week. So I'm glad a lot of our colleagues are here. And our, we have people from all over Europe. That's wonderful. We have people from down under. That's magic from Africa, even. Superb. This is really, really encouraging. So thank you very much. This seems to be working. No, so let's proceed to the next question. Which is really trying to find out what sector or field you're working in. So we can tailor a little bit how we're going to proceed in the next hour or so. A lot of uh, research and academic colleagues. People from healthcare. We have this third sector, local governments, the charitable sector, clinical practice.
healthcare systems. That's wonderful. Okay, thank you very much for this. It seems to be really working really well. So we're gonna to proceed to that much more important questions now. And the next question is actually quite difficult. So, and the question is, what is co-creation? Let's start there. So will I ask you to put a few words down about what co-creation is to you? Or what do you think it is? That's fascinating. That's wonderful. So many different adjectives, so many different ways of thinking about it. And I can't see at the moment anything that we would not consider not to be co-creation. The question is, is any of these words enough on its own or do we have to consider them all? And that's what makes our work so difficult. Wow. This is wonderful. So the diversity of points of view here is, is wonderful, but there is definitely a sense in that word cloud of major, major characteristics about what co-creation is. So actually, this is the first thing that we would want you to think about is actually what is the definition of creation and whether we need one. So that's the first thing when we started Health Cascade that we encountered issues with is to creation is talked about often. It's also talked about in, with, in many different ways. It's also often uh, entangled with other terms and terminologies such as co-design, co-production, engagement, participation. And it's difficult to tell actually what it is what it is not, and how to differentiate it from other form of participatory methods. In fact, if you look at the scientific research around uh, co-creation, we've noticed that there is more than 500 definitions that exist already. And there are new definitions that are being produced at the rate of about three per month, if you look at the graph on the, on the left. And it's also the first kind of piece of work that we did but we really quickly realized that that was an endless quest. And it might not be the best thing to do to add yet another definition of co-creation. Instead, is to really try to understand what are the key characteristics of what co-creation should be and what it should not be. So for to do this, we have thought about what co-creation, the word in itself, very precisely. And this is really the first tool we presented today, which is a simple decision-making tool that tells me, should I co-create or should we co-create or should we not? Is it the most appropriate? Is it the best thing to do? Should we bother? And trying to develop a decision-making tree to help people decide whether this is the right thing to do. And we have to start with the word co-creation itself. So in the word co-creation, we have the part, which is the creation. And that really means making something new directly in the real world. But it also has that prefix, which is co. And this is actually the key uh, to the characteristics because that co, which uh, means together, has some important consequences. Because really what it means in the characteristics of any co-creation process is that it should rely on collective intelligence. That's part of the call. That it should be a process of knowledge sharing. And that knowledge sharing 
should recognize and combine plural views. So recognizing that the world is complex and we all have different views on it and combine this plurality into something. And finally, that co means that we all have, all the people involved in the co-creation should have some shared part in the decision-making process. So these are four elemental characteristics that have to be demonstrated by the co-creation process to ensure that it's trustworthy and robust and rigorous. So generally we would want to use co-creation because we want to solve a problem. And we can think about two classes of problem, the problems for which we have no solution or problems for which we already have a solution. For the problems where there is no solutions, co-creation is very often appropriate, partially, specifically, if we think quite clearly that it's not something that one person can solve on their own, that we rely on multiple point of view, that we rely on multiple expertise, multiple intelligences to actually crack that problem and find a suitable solution. It often works quite well when we want to get to a quicker, to a solution that is acceptable. Maybe it's not the optimal solution, but it's a solution that is acceptable to the end users and the people involved. It gets a bit more tricky when there is already in, so, in a solution. If that solution works, there is no need to co-create. If that solution doesn't work very well in a real world, then you can ask you the question, is it a good thing to think about co-creation or not? In fact, often co-creation is used, or we've seen it used, or we've seen some processes called co-creation, when people still think that the solution they have works really well, but they just wanna make it a little bit better, or they wanna make it work a little bit better in the real world. And then they engage in, some, in just consultation which means they ask end users what they want and they transform their solution a little bit. It's not a process of co-creation as such. In that case, you're better off just really engaging in a piece of uh, consultation, so, so market research or in the implementation science to make your solution work better. So let me walk you through a couple of examples of how we can use these decision tools in pragmatic way. So the first example is a little bit of a silly one, but it, it, it gives you an, a, 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 an idea of how to use the tool. It's something that happens to me regularly as I cycle to work uh, every day. And I get a puncture and I want a solution quickly because I want to get to work on time. And it's also living in Scotland, it rains on my head a lot. I don't want to get wet, but, I also might need other people because sometimes I forget my puncture repair kit or to go quicker, I might need other people to work with me. So I might not be able to, to work on a solution on my own as such, but a solution exists and it works really well, which is my, uh, the, the, the puncture repair kit and how to take the, the tire off, how to glue the, the, the patch on, how to reinflate the whole thing. So there is no need for me to co-create or even say that my uh, puncture repair was a co-created event. It's not truly co-creation as such. So that's a very simple uh, decision for me to make. It gets a bit more tricky, as I said, in a case where we have maybe a pre-existing solution, but that solution might not work so well in the real world. In that case, let's imagine a, a, a a really, a really nice medicine pill has been created and is wonderful. It has wonderful effects shown in the laboratory and clinical, clinical trials and this kind of thing. But the problem is people are not willing to take it or they don't want to use it. Or, so it's not actually making such an impact in the real world. So at that point, you can ask yourself, well, should I co-create the solution or should I just consult with the end users about how we can package the solution better or change its delivery mode so that it's more acceptable. And in that case, we are probably more in a situation of, of um, uh, implementation science and trying to 
find how we can better market or better um, adapt the solution we already have to make the delivery better. And it's really very much the situation of, do you want the blue pill or do you want the red pill? That kind of solution. But neither of this is actually co-creation as such, as we understand it, because it's not making something new in the real world. And it's a, only a process of consultation as such. So <clears throat> I'm gonna hand you over to my colleague, Mariana, that's gonna present to you the rest of the tools we are delivering today before we take you step-by-step step through some of them today. Thank you, Seth, for your great uh, introduction. Uh, hello, it is a great pleasure to be with all of you today. My name is uh, Maria from Fundació Blanquerna in Barcelona. I am a supervisor and the communication and dissemination coordinator for Health Cascade. I would like to briefly run you through the tools we are making available today. Our program of research is ongoing and we will constantly update these tools. So please stay tuned as more and hopefully better will be available in the near future. We are also keen on receiving your feedback through our website and of course, along the session. Uh, today, we are making available seven tools to help you in all the stages of co-creation. There are tools to help plan, conduct, evaluate, report, and scale co-creation. You can find them all following this QR code and on our website, www.healthcascade.eu, shown in this slide. These tools are aimed to be useful in preparing a co-creation project and devise a protocol. They make you reflect about the relevant aspects that are required to be put in place before you start. So um, regarding our first tool, uh, please, yeah, yeah, thank you. Seb already walked you through our decision-making tree to help you decide whether to co-create or not. This tool aims to assist researchers, professionals, and policymakers in deciding whether co-creation is the most suitable methodology to be used. It is a rapid way to screen for co-creation eligible studies. Let me present now our second tool, um, before using co-creation as your preferred methodology, there is a need to frame co-creation in terms of theory. We think it is important to consider co-creation from the right lens, which we think is critical realism, a philosophical lens that recognizes that we do not know everything about the world we live in, and that each individual has different perspectives. Capturing this plural view and working with it is key to deliver trustworthy co-creation. Our third tool aims to alert you that fundamental ethical principles should apply throughout the co-creation process. And this requires using ethical reflexivity with a pragmatic approach that involves a continual process of reflections with the co-creators to check and prioritize the most important values. Of course, this is embedded in the definition of ethics in co-creations that we developed. And of course, I can read it for you in just a second. So we defined ethics in co-creation as seeking to act in virtue throughout the entire process amongst the existence of divergent interests, power dynamics, and knowledge differences through intentional behavior that is conscious of the shared responsibility and commitment to engage in a collective effort directed at improving health, in this case, within a specific context in a professional, justifiable, deliberative manner while considering mental and physical well-being for stakeholders that are involved. Regarding our fourth tool, 
We have also built up a co-creation knowledge base, which is an open online database that includes scientific references and co-creation. It includes the titles, abstracts, authors, and doys of co-creation studies from 1970 up to 2022 with upcoming periodic updates. We systematically searched all the scientific literature about co-creation and compiled this with the help of artificial intelligence into a single database, saving everybody time in accessing relevant information. The database currently contains over 13,000 articles relevant to co-creation and participatory methods. We checked the quality of this database thoroughly, and we aim to constantly update it. It is freely available as an open source resource, but some articles might be behind paywall. Regarding our fifth tool, uh, Produces Plus is a set of guidelines to design and execute co-creation. We aim to offer consistent steps for evidence-based co-creation studies and enhance reproducibility and scalability, including planning, methods, selection, evaluating, and reporting templates. You can find the entire document on the link. And uh, to help, we have produced this infographic. It is based on anachrony produces that help frame, plan, and set in place all stages of the co-creation process. Today, we are going to walk you through this step-by-step -step in our next activity and show you how we use Produces to set a protocol for co-creation. As part of Produces Plus, we have developed a reporting template to ensure governance and transparency in co-creation. It is a straightforward checklist of information that should be made openly transparent. Please, Smith, if you can, exactly. So that's the reporting template I was um, talking you about. Let's move on to our sixth tool, which is a method selector for co-creation, which is an interactive tool to select a co-creation method based on different criteria and aims to serve as a selection tool to pick the most appropriate co-creation method to use in your project. It is a pool of methods used across thousands of publications about co-creation projects. So it is the first comprehensive set of co-creation methods that we know about. We put particular emphasis on methods that enable collective intelligence and creativity. In this infographic, you can see the different criteria that you will be asked for, such as the co-creation stage, the aim of the project, the level of participation, the resources you have available. The tool will suggest suitable methods. We um, are taking into account your answer. Please note that there are several methods integrated into the guideline and that the full selector will be launched in 2023. So let's run you through our final tool. Our final tool is an infographic showing the key requirements of evaluation to support planning the evaluation of co-creation projects. We are aware that evaluation needs to be planned from the start and we must consider all relevant components. In a co-creation project, evaluation should be thought at the planning phase, but will take place in different stages. We should consider evaluating the needs assessment and implementation barriers and enablers, potential harm and burdens of process and outcomes, co-creators experience, including perceived sense of usefulness, shared ownership and partnership levels, feasibility, potential for replication, adaptation and scaling, effectiveness and the process evaluation, including fidelity. Well, I hope we didn't bore you too much. And before moving forward with our next activity, why don't we stand up and take a five minutes break because I think we all need one at this moment. 
stretch your legs and get ready to engage in a collect collective learning through an online game coming right up. Thank you very much. You can also prepare yourself a cup of uh, coffee or a cup of tea to get ready for the next phase.
Okay, so hopefully everybody's making their way back from their healthy break. Thank you so much, Maria and Seb, for a wonderful start of our masterclass today. Hello, everyone. My name is Danielle Agnello. I am one of the Marie Curie Fellows based at Glasgow Caledonian University. And I have the pleasure of guiding you through our interactive game today. As Seb said, we really want to teach you through a game to how to use the guideline and how to use produces. So that will be the purpose of today. And since there's so many of us, we hope you enjoy doing this through our online tool. I'll be co-hosting with my colleague, Juliana, who will come in later. And the contestants of the game will be all of you and our colleague, Mira, who you will, will be trying to match with. Next slide. Thank you. So the purpose of our game, we have some two different learning objectives. So we want to teach you how to apply this produces framework in terms of planning your co-creation project. So starting off right. And we also want to introduce you some, to some key questions that we suggest you ask yourself while you're going through the different stages of co-creation. We'll do this by introducing you to produces through the lens of an example co-creation project which will be represented by Mira, one of the co-creators and the facilitator, and we'll guide you through the different key questions within the game. Next slide. In terms of how the game will actually work, uh, we'll be using the same tool you've already been using today. We're gonna ask you a question about the example co-creation project. So really remember to focus when you get introduced to the project so that you can think through that lens. And then you'll put in your response that you think will most likely be the correct answer. And we're trying to get you to match to our co-creator, Mira. And if you get a match, that means you get a point. And the winner is the person that gets the most matches. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Mira, who's going to introduce you to this project. And we really want you to use active listening so you make sure you understand it. Next slide. And just this is a, a quick reminder. So produces is what Mira will present the project in. On the left side, you see this is built from Leask and colleagues uh, publication from 2019. So she'll be introducing along the produces and then the questions will actually come into these four stages of planning, conducting, evaluating and reporting. Next slide. Over to you, Mira. Yes, indeed. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mira Vogelsang. I'm also a Marie Curie Fellow at Glasgow Caledonian University in the Health Cascade Project, and I am investigating how to conduct co-creation in the workplace. So I'm first going to start off by introducing the problem we addressed in our case, namely sedentary behavior in the workplace. So high amounts of sedentary behavior is a big problem, especially in office workers. Uh, high amounts of sitting has been an increasing issue over the past decades and has become even more urgent and an even more urgent issue to address as it has been exacerbated for many people by the past pandemic and increase in homeworking. And the, this increasing attention to this problem is easy to show by the inclusion of sedentary behavior guidelines by the WHO in 2020, with them urging for people to limit their sedentary behavior. You can see it in this infographic I added on the slide how limiting your sedentary behavior is part of an active and healthy life. So in the project we used produces to break down this complex problem we have in order to get a handle on it and to plan our approach. Uh, on the slide here, you can see what that looked like. Um, so how we applied that produces framework in this case. So firstly, we have problem. So our problem was that high amounts of sedentary behavior in office workers. And the project actually focused on SMEs, uh, small to medium sized enterprises, as there is great variety between them. So no one size fits all. And they often lack the resources that larger organizations have to work on well-being and occupational health. Then the objective of the study was to put those resources they do have to good use and co-create with the employees uh, an intervention on sedentary behavior tailored to the needs and possibilities of the company. For the design, um, we did this by using the particip participatory action research where we focused on the iterative process of doing evaluation and reflection 
to refine the co-creation process and have it result in that tailored solution. We had a series of nine workshops of an hour and a half each, where all co-creators reflected also at the end of every workshop on where we needed to go to reach our solution. And this then helps inform uh, the following workshops. And lastly, um, for design, uh, as this was in the workplace setting, we did need also to work around or stop by certain holidays, like for example, the summer break. Then uh, end users, who would be the end users for this co-created intervention uh, in this project, that would be the employees working at the company. And then the co-creators were a group of six to 12 of these employees that formed a work group together uh, with the academic researchers as facilitators. Second to last is valuation. So in the case, we reviewed both the process of the co-creation through their engagement and their attendance, and also by reflecting with them on the process. Um, and as well, we measured the impact of the co-creation process on their sedentary behavior using pre-post measures of change of their sedentary behavior and by reflecting with them on the implementation of the interventions. intervention. Then lastly, we have scaling. Scalability. So for scaling, we will explore the use of the cascade model, where we will take the solution from this first company, and this will be proposed as a starting point for the next one. So thank you. This was a quick overview of the, how we use produces uh, in our case and in the case we will use today for our questions. I'll hand back to Danielle now. Thank you so much, Mira. So for those um, a view, just a quick summary, is that she'll be focusing on addressing sedentary behavior within a small medium enterprise, dealing with colleagues and employees 18 years or older as co-creators. She's evaluating both process and impact, and there's different kind of limits around the design. So try and think through that lens. Uh, this is, again, just a quick reflection. She went through that whole producer's framework on the left side. We think this is a very effective tool to plan your co-creation project as a first within the planning stage. And now we're going to move into questions uh, from each stage. I just want to remind you to reopen that tab or the uh, your device where you've been responding in Mentimeter. If you don't have access, you see on the top of the slide, you can go to www.menti.com and put in this code. 25911216. So I'll just give you a moment to make sure you're able to access the Mentimeter. And I see a lot of heart, so a lot of love for planning and the producer's framework. Fantastic. So we're going to be moving into the first stage of co creation, and the first stage is planning. And we just want to highlight there's two uh, principles that come from Liesk et al's uh, publication that are important to consider. So one is framing the aim of the study. So really trying to understand what are you trying to achieve um, and ensure that your process will be trustworthy and evidence-based and sampling. And this is really about the recruitment and the identification of your co-creators. And we highly recommend to do this in a very systematic way. So our first question for planning stage so it's a multiple choice question. You'll see it's a ranking type of question. We want you to select two. And the question is, what are the two most important elements that set the boundaries of this example co-creation project? So this project that Mira uh, spoke about. And we have different options here. So you can pick the number of co-creators might be the most important element. We have funding, available resources, time availability, deadlines they might be working with. We have the number of workshops, uh, type of co-creation methods that the co-creators are using, and whether they have an evaluation plan. So I see some responses coming in. We're having some top hitters already, but I see we only have 30 responses, so I'm going to make sure everyone gets the chance to respond. See evaluations kind of fallen. At the bottom there, I work on methods specifically, so I'm happy to see it's in third place. <laughs> and we have time and funding are kind of both fighting for the first place there. Together, we have about 60 responses, so I'll give a little more time since this is our first question. I want to make sure you all are able to respond. 
So if you were in this co-creation project, what do you think the two most important elements are? We still have some responses coming in, but while they're still coming in, you guys can still respond. I'm gonna invite Mira to speak on behalf of the co-creators. Mira, do you see any of the resources that you guys, or what any elements that you think were the most important for this project? Yeah, absolutely. They found it. Um, indeed, funding and available resources and time availability and deadlines were the two most important elements that sent set really boundaries to the project. Uh, and these then both defined uh, the other key elements. Uh, they determined, for example, the number of workshops we could do or how long these could take, the time that the company could give to these workshops or that we needed to consider holidays and work around uh, those. Um, I also wanna say that in the project I dealt with, um, we dealt with some of these uh, through agreeing and signing a memorandum of agreement uh, with them in advance uh, on the time and the resource commitment of both sides from us and a company and also on the flexi flexibility of the process. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mira. So if you guys responded to those first top two, then give yourself a point to get a point per match and just tally on your phone or you know, a piece of paper. So there's just two key takeaways that we wanted to highlight from this. So as Mira said, all the different elements are actually important to consider in co-creation, but there are two that really kind of set those boundaries. And when we say boundaries, we mean how you start and how you finish your co-creation. So what allows you to actually execute this project? And those were this funding and time availability. Okay, now we'll move on to our next question for the planning stage. So this is now we know time, financial and, and resources are very important. What other kind of resources do you think are needed for this project? So this is an open response. Um, we're gonna build a word cloud together. So you'll see it allows you to just put in one word. Um, you can put a few words. There's just 25 characters I think you're allowed to do. So I see some different responses are coming in. We have space, motivation, team, expertise and facilitation. So we have a mix of human resources, material resources, employee buy-in, talent. Oh, interesting, yes, trust, definitely. So motivation seems to be quite a big one. Motivation, co-creators, we have expertise, facilitation, All right, a lot of responses coming in. So we're building quite a nice word cloud. And maybe I I think, yeah, I see people. Okay, perfect. People, space, motivation, training of co-creators, very important aspect. Biscuits, <laughs> we like that one. People definitely need food in order to think and engage, yes. We need no low blood sugar in a co-creation project. Employees, so definitely with this case, we, we need to consider the employees. Employee buy-in I'm seeing come up, have some clear aims. So it's very dynamic, but while people are still putting in their inputs, I'm gonna invite Mira to come in again and comment a bit about some resources they needed in their project. Yeah, absolutely. I see, first of all, yeah, time and space. So like I said before, uh, we needed funding as the co-creation process requires a lot of resources, such as my time and their time, possible tools we use, or perhaps a co-facilitator if you're working with a larger group. And then, yeah, motivation plays into that essential thing of that commitment from the company and your co-creators. Um, we achieved, for example, with the commitment of the company through clear communication about the project, several meetings with them beforehand, signing that memorandum of agreement uh, together and continued updating of our contact person in the company. And then for uh, commitment with the co-creators, also very important that clear communication of the aims of the workshops, what we're doing, why are we doing this? 
educating them on, for example, the target behavior we were working on uh, and, and other uh, kinds of upskilling and all this to ensure that you have a consistent group that continues to engage uh, with those workshops. So yeah, they're definitely in there, the motivation, facilitation, that space, uh, definitely in there. Wonderful. So if you guys hit any of those keywords that came up, so motivation, facilitation, funding, uh, participants, kind of commitment, then you give yourself a point, I think, for this round. And there's just a couple takeaways we wanted to highlight from this question. So very much there are many resources you need, but really kind of thinking back to those boundaries, of course, funding is needed and funding relates to a lot of those responses you guys brought in where we're obviously building beyond funding in terms of the type of materials. Maybe you need funding to hire a facilitator. because You definitely want a very good uh, practice and uh, facilitator and then commitment from co creators is very important because there needs to be that buy in and people wanting to go through the whole process. In this uh, instance that Mira is speaking about, they also needed that commitment from the host company, for example. And without these things, we really think it's not possible to actually complete uh, the co creation process fully. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next question in the planning stage. So, this is another multiple choice question. You're going to be selecting all that you think apply. And the question is really around that kind of sampling and recruitment process of co creators. So it says, What do you think assisted uh, Mira, because she was the first person to kind of start this project and gathering her fellow co creators within that company she's working in? So we have different responses here. You're already seeing some answers. So one option is snowballing sampling. You may be familiar with that. It's really kind of the word of mouth type thing where you ask someone and then they ask someone and so on. There's picking your favorite employees in the company. We have selecting only one department. So perhaps it's a large company and you only want to work in like the IT or the HR department. We have using a contact person within a company. Uh, setting up profiles of the type of desired co-creators or running a campaign for recruitment. So already some quick responses. Happy to see people are in this mindset, in this lens of this project, responding quickly. We've got about 70 responses, so I'll give a few more minutes. So our, our lowest one so far is picking your favorite employee. So I think I think you're catching on to our wording there. We also have selecting only one department as a low hitter, but our top ones are really coming in with snowballing sampling, that word of mouth type process. We've using a contact person, campaigning for recruitment. So I think those are our responses are coming to a slow. So I'm gonna hand back to our representative of the project, Mira. Can you please let us know what the correct answers are? Yes. So um, we definitely want to highlight here that it's important to have a strategy for recruiting your co-creators. And my our strategy here was firstly to find a, uh, a contact person in the company. That, that was my first step to get a foot in the door, of course. And from there, together with them, we set up a profile of the people within the company that would fit the work group or that would be interested to hear about it. And we started a recruitment campaign, clearly communicating what the project is about, what the expectations are. Um, and overall, we took a snowballing approach to the recruitment by allowing people from the company to refer us to other possibly interested people. Wonderful. So if you guys got any of those answers, give yourself a point per match. So you might end up with three, four points on this question. And there are just a few key takeaways we wanted to talk about. So as Mira said, it's really having this strategy of understanding how you're going to start your project, how you're gonna do this recruitment. And we recommend, for example, you could do something like a stakeholder analysis to really understand who needs to be in this project. And having that contact person is a great way to begin. So it's really getting someone, a co-creator involved from the very first step of the project. And we recommend also within Produces uh, Plus guideline, we have different ways for you to sample. So when you look in there, you'll see some methods. So snowballing was one example of a method, but there's other methods you could use as well. Okay, so now we're gonna move into our next stage of co-creation.
And so you've finished your planning, you've set your producer's framework, you've got an idea of who you're gonna recruit, how you're gonna do it, what resources you have, you kind of have all your ingredients for your recipe and now it's actually time to cook. So you're gonna conduct and there's two different uh, kind of features we need you to focus on when you're conducting. Again, this is from the publication by Leask and colleagues. And the first one is manifesting ownership. So it's really trying to provide that sense of co-ownership amongst all the co-creators. And there's different kind of strategic ways to do this and also defining the procedure. So you've set the kind of frame of your project, but you do have to think about each step. For example, within a workshop, what are the specific aims? What are the specific methods you're going to do? So this is the conducting stage, and we have a few questions for this stage for you. So one example of something you can, a type of method you could do is setting ground rules within your project. So it's you're at the beginning of conducting, you know who's gonna be in the room, but you wanna know how are we gonna participate together? So this is again, thinking about this SME example project. What do you think was the most important ground rule that all the co-creators agreed upon? I see people already catching on. So we have uh, respectfulness, confidentiality, uh, let's have fun, transparency, don't be afraid to ask questions and none of the above. We see respectfulness is becoming quite popular. Transparency coming in second place. Confidentiality coming in third place. We have a lot of responses. We'll give a little more time. Let's have fun, an important one, but maybe not the most important. It's falling at the, the bottom there, or maybe it's something you don't agree upon. You just make happen together. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Maybe it depends on the type of uh, individuals you're co-creating with. Maybe they're not afraid to ask questions, or maybe they are. So you might have to tailor to your group. So as they're coming in, I'm going to invite Mira back to speak about in the project she's co-creating, what was the most important ground rule you guys set? Yeah, so we agreed together on these ground rules with the co-creators, and I want to state that all of these are very, very important, of course. But what we found crucial in our co-creation group, and especially as this was in the context of the workplace, was, and not many people found this, but it was confidentiality. So seven people get a point. Um, so we stress this point in more ways than one and walking the talk as well as a facilitator allowed really that creation of a safe space where employees felt more comfortable discussing work and health related issues, which was very important to start a discussion. Um, even if it's sedentary behavior it might not be a touchy subject for many people, but it can be for some people. So it really helped us um, have a good flow in, in our group. Um, and it's just yeah a big point that it's important that you discuss your ground rules with your co-creators as what they find my find important maybe different in other projects of course um yeah wonderful thank you so those seven individuals give yourself a pat on the back you got a match <laughs> <laughs> you got a point and of course like mira said all the ground rules are important but our key takeaway is really taking the time to set those ground rules together with your co-creators it's really also a way you can start to manifest ownership and create that safe space for everyone to engage. And it's really, we want to emphasize it's about this collective decision making. And in her case, uh, all of them decided confidentiality was the most important. Okay, so now we have a few more questions. We'll move on to the next question for a conducting stage. So you've now set your ground rules. But now maybe you need to do something which we um, call capacity building or upskilling. And the question here is another select all. So the question is, what do you think we need to ensure there's a collective understanding of? So within this group of co-creators that have all come together, what do they need to all understand? So you might have to think back to how Mira introduced the project to get these answers. For example, some of the uh, possibilities are sedentary behavior, how to implement an intervention, uh, what kind of engagement methods you use? What are the company policies? How do you use any digital tools that you might be working with and behavior change? Or the last one is none of the above. None of these are important. So people are coming in hot, very nice, lots of responses. 
You see our top hitter is sedentary behavior. So you definitely we're listening into our problem statement. We also have behavior change. And third place, we have the company policies. All right, and give a little more time as people are responding. Seeing some changes here. None of the above has some responses. Digital tools are coming in as well. So thinking back to we're doing a project in an SME to address sedentary behavior with employees. Okay, I see responses are coming to a bit slowing down. So Mira, do you see the type of areas you guys were collectively building capacity on? Yes, definitely. We found um, key areas that we needed to create that collective understanding was firstly learning about the target behavior, sedentary behavior. Um, we also trialed how to successfully implement an action, uh, including how to reflect on it. Um, throughout the workshops, we also learned how to work on behavior change and what the company policies looked like. And lastly, we took the time to become familiar with tools we were using, like Menti, um, or tools that were measuring their sedentary uh, behavior to really fully explain and, and that they could use it efficiently. Wonderful. So we have four potential points here. So if you guys match, we have 66 get a point for sedentary behavior. We have people that did behavior change. Uh, we have, sorry, thank you, Mira. Five. We have those that learned about implementing intervention, company policies, and also how to use digital tools. So if you got one or five of those, you get up to five points per match. And as Mira was pointing to, the most important takeaways about this is really taking that time to identify areas you may need to build the capacity on for the co creators. This is really important to ensure everyone feels confident in the process and they have all the knowledge they need to engage. So it's really setting that kind of even playing field from the beginning. Okay, we have a couple more questions in conducting phase. So we'll move on to the next one. Another multiple choice for you with the dots, it's select all that apply. And we've hinted at this already, but now we're going straight into the question of how do you think um, we are manifesting ownership in this project. So the first response is the co-creators lead the resource and environmental mapping exercise. There's consultation of the co-creators on the communication materials about the project. There's action planning of the intervention, the identification of additional co-creators together, perhaps, consulting the co-creators on the planning of the intervention, and testing the intervention and reflecting on it. So we see an even kind of spread. So I think this is a bit of more of a challenging one. I'll we'll give a few minutes as your responses come in. Wow, this is the most even <laughs> like split we've seen so far. So give some time for our 70 plus participants to respond. I think this one's a bit more of a challenging one. So allow a little bit of time. Maybe there's also terminology we're not so familiar with. So like resource environmental mapping. So we mean like the environment within the company and the resources within the company for that one. Planning intervention. So the intervention to address the sedentary behavior. Okay, so I see we're getting our total responses in the most almost completely even split with identifying additional co creators kind of falling behind a little bit. So, Mira, over to you to let us know uh, what the answers are. Yes, so in this case, we manifested ownership through having the co creators do their own resource and environmental mapping of their company. So, that's definitely a winner. Um, and they also did the action planning themselves, where they looked at what resources they needed, timing, responsible actors. Another exercise in the workshops was also to look for anyone else that would be suited for the work group that hadn't been reached yet. So for them to have uh, control over recruitment for a part. And lastly, they tested how to implement and reflect on an intervention. So these were some of the ways we focused on building that ownership throughout. 
I want to point out that I wouldn't use consult co-creators on outreach material and consulting them on the planning of, inter of the intervention, as these are not participatory methods that wouldn't aid in manifesting that ownership for the co-creators that we're looking for. We want to focus on ways that create that deeper engagement. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mir. So if you got the ones on the left or the right, so there's four possible points here, then go ahead and give yourself a point. And as Mira said, there's a key takeaway from this. Um, and the key takeaway is really pointing back to that first kind of decision support tree Seb pointed out at the beginning was focusing on this co. So when we're manifesting ownership, we're really trying to focus on that co part, which is collective intelligence, knowledge sharing, pluralism, and shared decision making. And this language of consult, as Mira pointed, Mira pointed out, is not really giving that manifesting ownership experience, it's very one directional. That's our key kind of takeaway is when you're manifesting ownership, kind of look more to participatory engagement and ways to engage collective intelligence. So we have one last question in the conducting phase for you all. This is an open question. Uh, it's definitely a challenging one. We're very much aware. So we're just curious to see what you think. And the question is how, in this case, how do you think uh, we will decide the project is finished. So when do you stop this conducting? When do you start closing things down and start the kind of evaluating and reporting stages? So we'll definitely give some time because I think this is a challenging one. Maybe Mira can help me read and reflect on these. We've got a lot of nice responses. Yeah, definitely see deadline pull it, coming up there already. And when in when there's time to report is coming up, yeah. Uh huh. And anchoring in the company, it can definitely be important in in workplaces. When the resources run out, yeah, interesting one. When we've met the aims, there's some kind of project product, yeah. When developed something met its aims. A lot of deadlines coming out. Yeah. PhD deadline, yeah. <laughs> and just in one. Funding running out, resources running out. So thinking back to the first questions where we set those boundaries, kind of the beginning and end. Mm -hmm. When the co-creators agree on the intervention, the very Maybe. nice response. Yeah, yeah. Someone saying policy as well, that that's their stopping point when that's been established. When the timeline indicates it needs to close. So yeah, really around that kind of deadline aspect. Maybe you plan super well, or you plan to just stop at a certain point in time. Yeah, also a different one there when the target group is happy with the intervention. So we're moving it away yeah. from the co-creators. Or when no new elements are coming up when the iterative mm. process maybe runs out. You run out of money or the company asks you to leave. <laughs> that's an interesting uh, one. I think that's <laughs> a reality. That's a, definitely. Yeah. Definitely in the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of commitment from the company and from the employees. So I could imagine that definitely being an aspect. Yeah, and someone phrases it nicely as well. You hope it never finishes because you hope the intervention will be embedded. Ah, wonderful. No finish. Never leaving. <laughs> She's part of the company now. Yeah. <laughs> they wish. <laughs> Building a consensus, sorry, aims met, deadline, and funding finished. All right, very complicated. Run out of coffee and biscuits. Indeed. <laughs> Number I would, one. I, I'm, I'm all for that one if I don't have my coffee. I definitely can't be as productive. I think we're getting a lot of really nice responses here. I'll I'll let while they still come in, I'll let Mira kind of speak to how um, in that co-creation project how you'll yeah, kind of consider yeah. finished. Yeah, for this project, um, the co-creation was considered finished when we reached a co-created intervention on sedentary behavior for the company. That we also all felt carried that sense of ownership um, by the co-creators. But importantly, also indeed was reached within our funding and time limitations. So it definitely came up several times in different ways. Hmm. Oh, sitting less. I just saw that one. <laughs> <laughs> but 
when everyone's sitting there, when we have a fully standing company and we yeah. do it. Quick solution, remove all the chairs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing that, Mira. And I think that highlights um, our key takeaway. So I think we'll move on, even though there's a lot of really nice responses coming in. So the key takeaway was really trying to remind you when you're doing that planning stage to really think about what will decide you're finished. Um, so have that discussion with your co-creators at the beginning, kind of set those boundaries together, maybe even set some objectives. We saw some things come up and people's responses about aims. Of course, the boundaries might relate to those resources people were speaking about and those deadlines that perhaps you might have to reach. And of course, I think that point about also the company may be asking for it to finish. They are a co-creator, so it's valid that they may have um, a response, but it's really setting that timeline with them in the beginning, I think can help quite a lot. And Mira's mentioned holidays and deadlines as well. So I'm gonna thank you all um, and hand over to my co-host. So thank you for going through the first two stages with me. I'm gonna invite Juliana to come up and take you through the last two stages of co-creation. Thanks so much everyone and thank you Mira. Yes, hi everyone. So we're on to the evaluation. So as previously mentioned, LISC and colleagues, for them, that is the fourth stage of the producer's framework, evaluating. So according to them, um, the two principles is important to evaluate the process and the intervention itself. So the process is intended as a way to ensure that the results are representative of the co-creator's opinion, that they're suitable, tailored, and valid for the end users. In terms of evaluating the intervention itself, it means that you're evaluating the outcomes. They also suggest including this in a clinical trial, if, if possible. So process and intervention and impact. So next slide, in terms of evaluation, we wanted to ask you the following question. So which aspects of the co-creation process is near evaluating? So select one among process, impact, process and impact, or none of the above. So I'll give you a few seconds for that. So a lot of you are saying and agreeing on process and impact. Some are saying process, impact. 53 answers in, I'll leave it a few more seconds. Okay, so I think that the majority of you are saying process and impact, so there's a clear answer there. Mira, is this what you're doing with your co-creators, with the group? Yeah, indeed. As as I said in the produce inter when introducing it with the producers framework, I both ev evaluated process and impact for this co-creation process. Perfect. Thank you, Mira. So, what we wanted to highlight from this um, again, it's that the, let's go to the next slide, please. So we wanted to uh, stress the importance of evaluating the impact and the process. And why is that? Because it's feasible, because the impact evaluation will help you answer the question, is the solution effective? While the process evaluation will help you understand why it's working or not. So the process evaluation helps you explore the mechanism of impact and understand why or not it is working. So process and impact if, if possible. So we're gonna look now into process evaluation. So we're gonna ask you a question around that. I'll wait the question to come up. So we wanted to ask you, what aspects of process evaluation do you think Mira is looking into? Is it engagement, facilitated reflection, adherence to the co-creation protocol, attendance, effectiveness of the solution, co-creators' reflections, or all of the above? Engagement is coming up a lot, co-creators reflections, facilitator reflection, all. At the moment, the highest, highest are engagement and co-creators reflection. 
So I'll give you a few extra seconds. Okay, 60 answers. So I'll ask Mira, Mira, is it what you're focusing on? Is it reflecting your process evaluation? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So for this project, I chose to evaluate the process by logging throughout their attendance and engagement with the co-creation process and also reflecting on the process with the co-creators and the co-facilitators throughout. So what we notice is also that Mira is not uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the solution, but in the process evaluation, because this would uh, concern the impact evaluation. So what we wanted to highlight here, go to the, yes, so it can be tricky to assess fidelity that is intended as the extent to which you adhere to your original protocol, but this can be done. So it's a question of walking this fine line between having a protocol that allows for flexibility, but at the same time to be clear about the constraints and stopping rules. So this can be tricky, but can be done. And of course, it depends on the process of the nature of the process itself, because the process is changing according to the co-creator's needs and feedback and dynamic. So moving on to the next question, we're looking now into impact evaluation. So we're asking what is Mira using to assess the impact of the co-created intervention on the target behavior? So how is she assessing impact? Is she doing it uh, via pre-post measure of change of target behavior? Through reflection and implementation of the intervention? She comparing to a control group or all of the above? So I see a lot of you are choosing measures of change of target behavior, reflection on implementation of the intervention. Some think Mira is comparing to a control group. And there's also mention of all the above. So I'll leave it a few extra seconds before we ask Mira what she's planning for her impact evaluation. So yeah, we have a clear so higher answer. Is this Mira what you're planning for your impact evaluation? Yeah, definitely the two top or the ones we, uh, we did. So I chose to evaluate the impact of this co-creation process by doing that pre-post measure of the change of their sedentary behavior, but also reflecting with the co-creators on the implementation of the that co-created intervention in order to assess the impact of that intervention on the sedentary behavior in the in the in the company in the SME. Thank you, Mira. So let's go to our key learning from this question then. So a lot of you have answered the control group, like compared to here control tri trial is the golden standard for impact evaluation, but the truth is that's not always feasible. So there is still a way to do impact evaluation and that's ensuring that the process is unbiased, is transparent, and that you adopt the scientific appro approach to your evaluation. So there's other methods, other ways. And as in this project, project case, um, Mira, for instance, is looking at pre post assessment measures. So yes, RCTs are the golden standards, but they're alternative methods to measure the impact of your co-created intervention. So on to the next, I think we are, we are at the reporting stage, if I'm correct. Yes, so this is the final stage of the producer's framework. Um, so what sort of um, the highlight, what we wanted to highlight here is that um, it's, it's a way to report, to report back on your co-created intervention and on the process. Um, we invite you to uh, use the Producers Plus reporting template that we developed um, and that is also available on, on the website. So the question, we have one question for this stage, which is the last question as well. And what we wanted to ask you is, 
So who are the key stakeholders that we need to report to during and after this project? So this is an open question. So we invite you to add as many stakeholders as you think we should report back. So there are many. So we also wanted to, to leave this question broad as it also will be depending on the project itself and on the nature, on the process of the project, but definitely important to report. So funders is coming up a lot, of course. In this case, the company makes sense. The co-creators, very important. We're gonna highlight that. Um, Sponsors, meaning I imagine the funders, company leadership, having them involved is crucial too, right? Policy makers, board, participants of the process, so co-creators rather than participants. Co-creators, funders, and the company, yes. So a few of them are coming up more than others. So Mira, would you want to tell us a bit more about who you're engaging for your reporting? Definitely. <laughs> um, so the key stakeholders that we reported in uh, in this project were the co-creators themselves, of course, and then um, also the company contact point, um, as well as the funder and the scientific community, um, and importantly, also the wider public. public. So that's the plan. <laughs> these uh, last three. Perfect. Thank you, Mira. So on to the key message about reporting. So we wanted again to invite you to use the producers plus reporting template. And also, if you do, to reach out to us, tell us, give us feedback on the template itself. That will help us build on the next version, the new version of the template, but also of the guidelines. So if you do reach out to us as well and with comments and feedback, and then really highlight the importance of reporting because that is crucial to ensure transparency, knowledge sharing and replicability. So without reporting, those three elements cannot be achieved. So crucial and that is why Lisk and his colleagues have uh, made it a stage in itself, I imagine. So yeah, so I think we are, this was the last question, yes. So, oh, yes, so last question, but we wanted to summarize the key takeaways. Um, we wanted to, again, invite you to use the producers framework, but also the producers plus reporting template to um, import the, stress the importance of planning a protocol, a protocol to be flexible, but at the same time to be clear on time constraints and stopping rules. So this balance is fine line between those two elements flexibility and time constraints and be clear about the stopping rules. We also learned agreeing on ground rules makes all the difference. And as we saw as well, that depends on the project and on the, um, the co-creators that join the project. To identify in advance the components and the aspects that you want to include in your evaluation, very important. So you plan in advance and you know what you're evaluating according to what is feasible as well. Um, ideally process and impact, but be clear about what you want to evaluate. And then remember to report and include, of course, co-creators in this step. So those were the overall key takeaways and we want to thank you for having joined the game. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have matched a lot of answers. So a lot of winners, I'm sure among you. And so with this, we wanted to um, for you to practice the key questions that you might want to ask yourself when conducting and planning uh, a co-creation process, and also to sort of interiorize the uh, producers' uh, steps and principles. So yes, thank you, Mira. Thank you, everyone. And back to Seb. You're muted, Seb. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Mira, for this wonderful um, game of co-learning you led us through. As we said, you can find all these tools and resources on our website, healthcascade.eu, 
or you can scan this uh, QR code, they're all freely available. But as I said, they are, our project is on, ongoing. So come back and check again, uh, because we will be updating this and providing more and more resources, refining them as we go along. And as with everything, we want to progress this and make these resources as useful and pragmatic as possible. So for this, we really need your inputs and getting a bit of feedback about how we make those as useful to you as possible. So we've prepared a really short form. It's only two questions. So we will ask you if you can follow that link or scan that QR code to just spend a couple of minutes answering these because we want to run more of these uh, masterclasses and we want to tailor them better. And we want to make the tools useful and pragmatic. But to do that, we need to understand your needs a little bit more and what you enjoyed and what you didn't. So please spend a little bit of time, just a couple of minutes filling this, um, this feedback form. It's not so much about whether you enjoyed it or not, it's about what you want to see in the future. Um, and uh, we'll be then talking to you about what's coming up next. And in particular, we would, how you can interact with us in the future through our social media or newsletter. In terms of feedback and developing this, Alf Cascade will ultimately result in a whole training uh, curricula and a training program. So we need to understand a bit more about what the training needs are and where the emphasis should be. So we will be calling out for uh, interest in developing and, and, and letting us understand what these training needs are. We'll have an event in March around this, and we will be inviting key stakeholders, key uh, people that are developing co-creation projects around the world to come and, and join us in this development workshop. So if you are keen to take part, contact us. You can contact us via our website, our social media, or any other channels, and we'll always be happy to learn and get some feedback from you. So while you're filling that form, we can move on to the next slide, Neve, and I will show you, sorry, yeah. So these are our social medias. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on LinkedIn, obviously like our website, and you can also join up uh, to receive our newsletter which is sent and you can always uh, opt out of it if you don't like it in the future, but it's a good way for you to keep in touch with all the different uh, kind of disseminations and, and events that we will be running in the next couple of years at least. Uh, saying this, thank you all for joining us today. And I need to thank the whole Health Cascade team for preparing this, this workshop. But what you do not see is all the amazing work that has been done in the background because everything that is presented to you is things that are evidence-based. So that has, is resting on a great deal of scientific work that have allowed us to present these simple but incredibly important tools because they respond to problems and successes that we have been able to extract from the scientific literature in the last few years. So beyond that, there is a work of many, many people, the whole Health Cascade Consortium, they're not all here today, but I wanted to thank them all for their fabulous collective work that led us to today. And I welcome you all to, again, come and join us in the future. So sign up to our newsletter, contact us on, on send us your feedback via the forum, contact us on social media, and we will make sure to invite you to the next step of our co-creation masterclasses. And it's just now for me to say again, thank you for joining us. I really hope you enjoyed this, that you find it useful. Join us again. Have a great afternoon, morning or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for joining a Scottish Co-Production Week. We hope to see you on this next year as well. Bye-bye.